This is the Sony FX6. It won't overheat. It's incredibly heavy to hold with one hand, but a complete joy to use. If you're thinking of picking one of these up, you've never used a cinema camera before, this might be a pretty good video for you to watch. If you wanna know how this handles, how it feels to use, if you can remove this top handle, or you can use your own monitor, stick around. Now spec wise, I'll be fully upfront. I'm not covering everything today. I'm covering very specific things. Plus Gerald Undone's already won the Oscar for the FX6 review. So why would I even bother trying? But who am I to even attempt to talk about this monster? I'm a Sony mirrorless full frame camera user and APS-C as well, have been for about four years. If you like talking about gear, you shoot weddings, commercial jobs, make little short films for yourself, even just film family stuff with your cameras, you might wanna try hitting subscribe down below because those are all things I talk about and ramble about far too much. So is the FX6 worth it over the A7S 3 100% yes, but also definitely no, not at all. It's entirely subjective to what you're gonna be using it for. And if you're asking that question, to be honest with you, it's probably not for you. For YouTube, you definitely don't need this. For vlogging, if you're even thinking of vlogging with this, you just have far too much money. This is designed for long form content, handheld stuff, documentary stuff on a set. The manual labor of video work. So in no particular order, let's start with what I'm gonna be talking about today. It has S Cinetone, which is a color profile Sony is very well known for. It's a baked in color, but just straight out of the camera, it's absolutely beautiful. Everything I shot was in S Cinetone because I'm lazy and I don't like to shoot with S Log or other picture profiles, but also because S Cinetone just looks that good. The highlight roll off is probably the most pleasing I've ever seen. And there's something about the video I just can't put my finger on. It's beautiful and I honestly think it's got something to do with all being shot in S Cinetone. Everything you're seeing on the screen right now is shot with S Cinetone using either the 90mm macro or the 24 to 105 f4 from Sony. And in terms of how it looks versus the A7S III's standard color, let's take a look at that now too. Everything you're seeing on the screen here is shot with the 24 to 105. I actually picked up one of those lenses while in the process of testing the FX6 with the 24 to 105 that it came with, so it's a pretty fair test. Let's take a look at a color chart as well, side by side, so we can see in a little bit more detail there how it renders the colors. One of the big appeals of this camera is the electronic ND filter. And after using this for some time, it really got me thinking about how this would change my workflow for shooting things like weddings and commercial jobs, because it's that good. There's no faffing about with screwing on filters and unscrewing filters and changing lenses and more filters. Everything is done internal and it's really easy in terms of how it works. You either do it manually using the dial on the side here, or you set it to auto and just watch it work flawlessly. You set up your exposure to whatever you want, you set your ISO to whatever you want, and then the ND will go up and down to make sure that that exposure is always exactly the same without changing your aperture or your ISO. Even if you go from a darker area to a lighter area or from inside to outside, as long as you have your exposure set properly for the darker area, when you move into the brighter area, the ND has you covered. It will make sure everything just is exposed properly. One of the best bits about this is that you can't see it physically changing. It's so gradual. There's nothing coming across the sensor, which you then see in your video. The only time you actually see the ND is when you turn it on or turn it off. A little symbol appears on the screen right here, just letting you know that the ND is on, and then you see it just go up and down live as it's correcting your exposure for you. The only time you'd need to really intervene with the ND is if you get into an area where it's really, really bright, and then you just have to increase your aperture to compensate for that. This doesn't have the same touchscreen functionality as something like the A7S III. You don't have your tap to focus or your tap to track, which you might think is kind of annoying, but you still have your eye tracking and your face tracking as well, which are just as good as the A7S III. But a feature I started using a little bit more was my manual focus override. Basically, let's say you're shooting something and you see someone's faces being tracked by the camera, but then you decide, actually, I want to get the background in focus instead. You can manually turn the manual focus ring on any Sony lens and any 
e-mount lens that has autofocus and it will override and now you can focus on whatever you want. As soon as you let go, a couple of seconds later, it will just continue to automatically track. You don't have to toggle between the autofocus and the manual focus switch. You don't have to change the focus mode on the camera anywhere else. You just turn the manual focus ring. And I don't know if it's just because having the hand grip there is perfectly placed and then the lens is perfectly placed for you to be able to hold it and just manually focus but it just made you feel so much more involved with the process of shooting video. Way more so than if I was just tapping on the screen and letting the camera do its thing and moving around. It just is a really nice camera to shoot with. I hate to say it, but a few days of shooting with this, if you love to shoot video as much as I do, you're gonna fall head over heels in love with this pretty quick. Someone asked me if you could change out the 3.5 inch monitor on this, the stock one that the FX6 comes with for your own monitor. And the short answer is yes, but there's a couple of caveats with that as well. So this, Although it is a touchscreen monitor, it's not a regular touchscreen monitor. Like you can go through the menus and change things and everything like that. But because there's no tap to focus or anything like that, I don't really find myself using it that much. So you have a D-pad on top of the handle here and you also have a D-pad on the side grip, which I actually end up using more than the touchscreen for going through the menus. It's pretty much as the same as the D-pad that comes on your Sony a7S III right up the top right there. Another way of quickly going through the menus is using the, I don't know what it's called, the multi-interface button. And this is essentially a button that rotates up and down. You can also click in on it and that's how you can go through menus a little bit quicker too. So in theory, yes, you can use your own monitor instead of the stock one that this comes with or as well as if you wanted to. You'll just need to turn on the HDMI menus in the menus of this camera first. That way you can view everything and you don't have to rely on using this to just be able to change settings. Now, with that being said, there is actually a couple of features on this monitor that I quite like and end up using quite a bit. So that might change your mind as well. You'll see when I rotate the monitor right there, it actually doesn't flip it. So if I manually use the slider on the bottom here, that will now flip that monitor as you can see there. And then there's also a mirror. So you have manual control over that opposed to it doing it automatically, which it does on the A7S III and honestly you got kind of annoyed about. So that's a pretty useful thing. And then on the side of the monitor, you actually have three more buttons, a custom nine button, a focus peaking button and a zebras button. So you can quickly turn those on and off on the monitor just by tapping those buttons. And those are pretty useful to use. And I mean, I use those tools all the time. And if you do as well, you'll quite like using them on this. So if you didn't want to use this monitor, you'd lose the ability to do that. You'd have to remap custom nine if you're using it to something else on the camera. Uh, and you'd have to use whatever focus assist tools come with the monitor you're using because you don't have that monitor available. So that was a really long answer, but yes, you technically can use your own monitor if you wanted to. And something else to go on top of that, I've used this outside quite a bit the past few weeks and it's winter in Canada right now and it's incredibly bright. When you get all that snow on the ground, the white just reflects the sun straight back up. So it's brighter than you'd ever get on a summer's day and you can still view this completely fine, which I was a little bit worried about because there is no EVF on this like you have on something like the A7S III. And typically with a super bright day like this, I would default to using the EVF because I can't really see the screen very well. No issues with seeing the screen on this. On top of that, this is actually a pretty high res screen as well. It's 2.7 million dots compared to the A7S III, which is 1.4 million dots, and then the A7 III, which is 927,000 dots. So this is pretty high res. And you can, of course, move this wherever you want. It simply unscrews here. You can mount it to the top of the handle at the back here. You can also mount it to the back of the body here on the left. You can also mount it to the back of the body on the right. Um, depending on other mounts and cheese plates and things like that, you could probably mount this in other positions as well. I'll throw some B-roll over the top here to show you all the different positions because when I was looking at this camera myself online, I wanted to know where you could mount this and there really wasn't any video showing that. So you're welcome. And just in case you're wondering how it does look with the Ninja 5, here is some B-roll of that over the top as I'm talking right now. And then the same thing again, but with the Portkey's P6 monitor instead. So this is actually a pretty decent monitor I quite enjoy using when I'm not using the Ninja 5. Now, to go a little bit further in this area of the camera, this big handle on top here, I gotta say I'm not a fan. I don't love the way it looks. It's very reminiscent of a uh, dad at a wedding, 19, circa 1985, camcorder style. I understand that it does have its purpose, but I don't love it. It does add a huge amount of size, albeit it's pretty useful to hold like that. I did find when I was walking around, I kind of hold it like, like that and it, it does work 
quite well in that respect. So I will give Sony that. But there are instances where I probably wouldn't want to use this. Or if I did want to use a handle, I'd maybe put a little small rig handle on here instead, make it a little bit more compact. But there are a couple of issues with removing this handle, and I'm sure you've heard of them. The first big one is audio. On the top of the handle here, you have your two XLR inputs. And if you want to use a 3.5 mil jack microphone, for whatever reason, you'd have to buy one of these little adapters. This is a Rode XLR uh, male to 3.5 mil mic jack. They're 10 bucks, they're pretty good. I use this quite a lot and it works fine. So heads up, if you need to use 3.5 mil, you don't have it anywhere on the camera whatsoever. You have to go through the XLR port. But with nothing plugged into any of your audio inputs, you actually have a pretty decent omnidirectional microphone on the top of the handle just here. If you're wondering how that sounds, I did a couple of little examples here, including a blogging one, because why not? Internal mic on the FX6 from probably about six feet away now, roughly, in my studio, which is in the basement. There's no sound treatment in it. It's pretty echoey. And this is the internal mic on the FX6 from six inches away. FX6 built-in handle mic, Rode Video Micro. FX6 built-in handle mic, Rode Video Micro. This is if you wanted to vlog with the FX6. From about a foot and a half on a very, very windy, snowy, cold day. When you take this handle off, you no longer have any XLR inputs or if you're using a little adapter, you don't have your 3.5 mil input, but you still have an audio source and it's called a scratch track. It's a very low quality microphone. I was trying to figure out where it is and I think it's around here somewhere. There's two little dots, I, I think it's there. It's pretty low quality, but if you wondered how it looked, well, sorry, how it sounded, then uh, here's some examples for you. So this is a test using the internal scratch mic on the FX6. The handle isn't attached whatsoever. Okay, this is from five feet away on the internal mic of the FX6. The handle is off, it's right here. I am now six inches from the mic, haven't changed the settings whatsoever. I'm now gonna walk around the left side of the mic. This is the internal scratch mic on the FX6. The handle is disconnected. I'm now behind the camera about five o'clock. Off to the right hand side, back round to the front here. That's how the FX6 internal scratch mic sounds. Now you'll know more than anyone else whether just using the scratch track with the audio quality I just showed you would work. Now you're probably not gonna use this as your main audio source, it's just to match up in post. For most of the things that I shoot, I don't ever see this being an issue because I normally record externally anyway. If I was to pick one of these up, and I'm seriously considering it, I would probably use it for the most part without the handle, but continue to use the monitor because you don't have to have the monitor attached to the handle here. You can go directly onto the body. The monitor plugs in on the side just here. Now to go on to this point a little bit more from removing the handle, the menus in this camera Let's just say they're not the most user-friendly in the world. They're nothing like using the a7 III or any of the APS-C cameras. They're nothing like using the a7S III. They are their own complete variant of, mon of uh, menus, and they're not great. Things are laid out very differently, and once you get used to where they are, it's pretty straightforward because it's muscle memory, but the problem is a setting could be multiple menus deep. So you have to scroll through multiple pages to find that one setting. So no matter how quick you are, it still takes time to go through those pages, which means you end up relying on custom buttons quite a bit. And by removing this top handle, you actually lose custom button seven and custom button eight as well. So if you don't have those, you now have to map those buttons to something else, which means you're potentially losing another custom button. So having the extra two custom buttons is actually pretty useful. Now you do get a quick menu button by pushing the menu button once, but it's 10 pages of quick menus. It's not like the quick menu on the A7S III where everything is just in two rows. It's, it's literally 10 pages that you have to scroll through. It's really not that quick. And then to get to the full menu, you click and hold the menu button for about a second, and then that brings you up your full menu. One of my favorite things about shooting with this camera is the hand grip, and it just feels so natural to shoot with, and I think that's why I enjoyed shooting with it so much. There's a button on the side, oh, you can actually detach this if you don't want to use it, but once you've used it, you will want to use it. There's a button right here where you can just touch it with your thumb, and then you can angle the camera, and the hand grip stays exactly the same, and it locks in whatever angle you want. So if you need to go low and shoot up, your wrist doesn't change angle. If you want to go down, your wrist doesn't change angle, and it just feels so good to use. The other great thing is that you have nearly everything you need to shoot controlled with this one hand. So I've got a zoom rocker right here, which I'll talk about in a second. 
You've got a dial here for controlling whatever you want. I used it for controlling my ISO. You have two cust three custom buttons, actually. You've got custom button five, four, and then there's one under the back here. You have a D-pad for controlling all your menus, and then you have a record button. So you can literally record everything just one hand and focus on your video. So I tended to shoot handheld a lot like this. And it just works. It feels lovely to shoot with. Much different to shooting with something like this, which I've got a handle on as well now. But once you've shot with this, it really makes you feel like this isn't very ergonomically friendly to shoot video with. It makes you realize this is still a stills camera body, essentially. You have nine custom buttons on the FX6, one, two, and three on the side. Your fourth is on top of the hand grip here, right under where your index finger rests. The fifth is just to the right below the record button. It's uh, right under where your thumb would go. The sixth is a little bit harder to show on video, but essentially this finger here, when it's resting in here, it's right in this gap here. So it's really ergonomically placed to be able to do whatever you want with that sixth button. And then the seventh and eighth is on top of the handle, as I already said, and then the ninth is on the edge of the monitor. After playing around with all the buttons in different setups and experimenting, I found this to be the best setup for me, but it all depends on how you shoot. Also, if you're using the handle as well. Number one, I assigned to S and Q, more on Y in a second. Number two, I assigned to autofocus speed and sensitivity. Number three, I assigned to my ISO gain, high or low, and we'll talk about that in a second too. Number four is my focus magnification, so you can literally tap with your index finger to zoom in and see if it's in focus, and then click it again and go in even further pretty useful. Number five is your direct menu, which allows you to quickly get to menu settings on the on the screen here. So control things like your shutter speed, aperture on the fly with the D-pad if you want to control it that way. Number six, underneath the handle there, I actually had assigned to auto white balance, uh, to toggle between auto white balance and my preset white balance, which is 5600. You also have a three position switch on the side there for controlling white balance as well. So as well as having an auto white balance or going to your preset with a custom button like I do, you can assign three other white balances too. Number seven, I have assigned to eye autofocus, face tracking, and then off to toggle between those three. Number eight, again, I had assigned to base ISO high or low because it's dependent on if I'm using the handle or not. And then number nine is for your assist features, your waveforms, your histograms, and your vector scopes. And then if you push it for the fourth time, it toggles off. So you don't have any of those assists on. One annoying thing about this is there was no easy way to assign changing frame rates quickly. So you have to physically go into the menus to do it. You can't assign a custom button to go between like 23.98 to 60 frames per second. Why is this useful? Well, if you're shooting like a talking head segment and then you need B-roll, you have to go into the menus to do it. Way around this was to assign a custom button to slow and quick mode and then have that set to 60 frames per second. It works fine for just B-roll, but if you needed audio, for whatever reason, you don't get it in slow and quick mode. Okay, so let's talk about ISO because it's a big difference if you're coming from something like the A7S III. On the side here, as I said, you have a three position switch for controlling three different customly set by yourself uh, ISO settings. The FX6 has two base ISOs. The low is 800 and then the high is 12,800. And you have to specify which you wanna use by going into the menus or by assigning a custom button. So you can quickly tap it and go from low to high. Now, something to be aware of, if you're in say the low base ISO and then you crank it, you can actually get up into the territory of where the high base ISOs start too. And it'll let you go all the way through that. But the problem you're gonna have is your video is gonna be much lower quality opposed to if you had set it to the high base ISO and then went up from there. So let's say you're using a low base ISO and you get to like 12,800. Well, if you just set it to the high base ISO at 12,800, that's gonna be a much higher quality than if you are using the low base ISO and you went up to 12,800. Hopefully that makes sense. Which leads me to my next point, which is if you're in the low base ISO setting and you start to get to six or 8,000 ISO, it might be more beneficial to switch to a high base ISO and just apply the electronic ND. Your video might be better quality. So it's something to, consider and bear in mind. It's essentially the same thing as what this camera does, apart from this controls your low and your high base ISOs automatically for you. This means you have to set it yourself. So the FX6 actually has two zoom rockers, one on the side grip and one on the top handle here. Now, if you use a servo lens, like a lens where you can click and hold and it will zoom in and out, this will control that. But you can also assign this to clear image zoom. So to give you a little bit extra punch on whatever lens you're using with little to no quality loss, highly debated. It's there and that's what I used it for and it's pretty useful. Camera doesn't have any form of IBIS. So that means you're gonna probably wanna use a lens that has OSS. Now, 
if you're holding this handheld and you're not using a lens with OSS, it's not gonna be terrible because it's a heavier setup anyway. So you're not gonna get those little micro shakes that you would with a little mirrorless camera. But there's a big difference between shooting with OSS on and OSS off, especially if you're zoomed right in. Here's a couple of examples for you. Optical steady shot is currently turned off. Zoomed in all the way to 105 and on. Off again and on. So this is optical steady shot turned off walking in pretty deep snow. Turn it on right now and now it's on. Just for an example of how it looks when walking, once again off and now back on. In terms of codex on here, I use the XAVC-I and XAVC-L. Both went into my 2019 Mac, which is like middle of the road spec, and it handles it with no problems whatsoever. Video opens in Finder with no issues. I can throw it into Final Cut. I don't need to create proxies. I always forget the name of the file, but it's an MXL file instead of an MP4. So it handles pretty good compared to like this, which you pretty much have to make proxies for. So key differences to the A7S III, the side grip here, the handle, the amount of custom buttons, the ease of use once you fully understand how this works, where all the buttons are, what they all do. I feel like this is an easier camera to shoot video with. It's, I feel like it's more reliable, it's more fun to use, it's more enjoyable to use. And uh, I think it's because it's a camera designed for shooting video. It's not a camera that's shooting video in a form factor for stills camera. Also, the battery life is absolutely ridiculous. Now they are insanely expensive and big batteries. This battery here uh, costs $350. It's a 37 milliamp battery, milliamp hour battery. Um, I did a shoot the other day and I was shooting for about two and a half hours, pretty much nonstop. And I still had about 90 minutes left on the battery of this. So you're literally limited by however much space you have on your two memory cards. And uh, it's the CF Express Type A cards and the SD cards. It's that smart dual slot that they have on the A7S III. So in terms of, am I picking one of these up? I don't know yet. It's still so hard to get hold of. I don't think they've even shipped properly yet. This was a loaner from Sony that I have to send back regrettably, but I'm kind of leaning towards yes, I think I will. What do you think? Let me know in the comments down below if you've made it this far. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one. Take care.